Royne Stolt is a founding father of Swedish progressive rock. He's been involved with numerous bands and projects including the Flower Kings, the Tangent, Transatlantic and most recently Agents of Mercy. He joins me now online from Sweden. Thanks for speaking with me, Royne. Oh, you're welcome. Now, what kind of changes in music have you seen since your early days with uh, Kaipa, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, in the 1970s? Yeah, Kaipa, yeah, that's right. Kaipa. Uh, okay. Well, I, I've seen many, many changes. Uh, because, you know, I, I started listening to music in the 60s, uh, like many, many others growing up with, uh, with the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and stuff like that, Jimi Hendrix. And... Um, and then started playing, uh, starting my own bands in the beginning of the 70s and then uh, ending up in, in Kaipa, which was the first band that actually had some commercial success, uh, making three albums on the Decca label and touring, uh, mostly in Sweden, in fact. But um, at the time, we were quite a popular band here. And uh, uh, at that, that, you know, that time was kind uh, a time of, of musical freedom and, and a time when progressive music was probably at its peak, I would say. Um, so um, I've been through that, you know, uh, and uh, we had a couple of successful years, maybe four or five years with Kaipa and then uh, entering into the 80s. Uh, seeing music uh, become more commercial again and um, also see uh, uh, all the uh, the technical stuff you know around music production change a lot you know with the drum machines coming in and the sequencers the synthesizers so I think that changed the music scene quite a bit but it also became more uh, more commercial and more uh, focused upon the looks and the image and stuff like that and uh, I've seen the different faces of of, uh, of heavy metal and and hard rock. You know everything from Led Zeppelin and and Deep Purple in the in the late sixties to uh, to the eighties uh, hair bands <laughs> and all that. So so yeah yeah you know I'm I feel kind of grown up and and seen uh, lots and lots of changes in the music uh, music scene and the music business. And uh, but it, uh, it in a way you know I mean in the big picture it's it's I mean there's still the commercial music is sort of what what dominate the picture but uh, i think uh, probably uh, more adventurous uh, rock music and progressive rock uh, is uh, probably healthier today than than i mean than it's been for a long 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 time yeah. that's how i see it from 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 sweden and the way i've been touring you know in the last couple of years that, that's how i see it it's still not very very big but n not like in the 70s you know when when bands like yes could sell a couple of million albums but but it's still i it seems like a kind of a i don't know like a kind of a healthy situation i think for and and also i think again the technology has helped many bands to not wait until they get a, a record deal, you know, to get into the studio and record. You can actually buy a computer and, and lots of software and plugins and they can produce their own album and they can even release it on their own label and and, uh, and sell it on the internet or, or iTunes or whatever, you know. So it's I think that helped a bit too. Yeah, it does help a lot. Um, now, you've said that Drama Rama, which is the latest Agents of Mercy album, only just been released, that was an mm -hmm. attempt to find your your early influences. Um, you mentioned a, a few bands that were around at the time, but were there some specific influences that um, that you discovered you had, and and what appealed to you about them? Well, I mean, I mean, frankly, we didn't think much about it. It was more like we had uh, we had a few things that we wanted to achieve, and and a few like uh, guidelines, I would say, and before we started recording the album, and we said let's not focus. Too much on on production and, and on uh, on whether the, the the music is tight and and uh, sounding commercial or or whatever made for radio all the, those things you know so so we said let's let's do it like we did in 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 the beginning of, of the 70s uh, and in the 60s you you just played your songs you rehearsed them and then you went into the studio and played them live in the studio instead of like many many bands do today they they construct a, like a song in a in a in a in a in a computer or in a sequencer and then they 
they sort of you know start recording the drums and they they add the bass guitar and then the guitarist comes in and, and try all the different sounds and add his stuff and so building from, from more like from a, a, a demo production building up the sounds bit by bit and I think uh, and we tried that we did we did that f for a couple of albums with Flower Kings uh, but I, I think for me the, probably the wake up call was when we started recording the first Transatlantic because we we actually uh, uh, just went in and we didn't have, I think, <laughs> when we started recording the first Transatlantic album, the first couple of bars, we, we just started recording and we didn't know how the, the song would end, you know. It just went on, you know, and, and whatever idea comes up, you know, we tried it. And, and uh, it felt like, um, for me personally, it felt like going back 30 years, you know, in time. And, and, and I, I remember how much fun it is to be in a room together with musicians and actually play the music and and you know just play and jam and see what comes up and so i think that that was the guideline for for doing the the latest uh, agents of mercy album where the first album was more like as i described made from like a sequencer or a computer like a skeleton of of, of ideas and then you you sort of tag on the the keyboards the, the bass the drums etc cetera, etc cetera. and people weren't actually even in the same room yeah. So, yeah. So that that's um, I think that that's probably about the only guideline we 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 had, you know. And and um, there were as as I mean mentioned in the promotion, it's we we mentioned a couple of bands we were influenced by, but there's so many influences, and and you have also to remember that uh, the youngest member in this band is just turned 25, and I'm 54, so it's. <laughs> It's quite a difference, you know, and and I'm, I'm sure he has lots and lots of band he listened to a musician he listened to that that I don't even know of, you know, and 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 vice versa, and, and uh, we're coming from different places, uh, but we have we find some music in common, and uh, you know, try to make it, uh, you know, as original as possible, as as uh, you know, to make the music alive as much as possible. Yeah. Now, I want to talk more about uh, Agents of Mercy uh, in a moment, but mm -hmm. I noticed that you've you've named your sons, uh, Johann Sebastian and yeah. Peter Gabriel, in honour of your two most respected musicians. Uh, kind of different oh. different kind of musicians. How close do you think the link between classical and progressive rock is? Uh, I mean, f I mean, first, uh, it's it's just I mean, it just happened to be two two persons. Johann Sebastian is is not like uh, I'm I'm the biggest fan of Johann Sebastian Bach is, or or Peter Gabriel. I'm I'm a fan of both musicians, but it's to me it seemed like I I, I wouldn't call my son Frank Sapp or something like that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or Ozzy Osbourne. I, I bet uh, you they're grateful uh, for that. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm sure they are. But you know, it's it's like it just seemed like Johann Sebastian is also a very nice name. Um, uh, so we call him Sebastian, and uh, in in terms of, of Peter Gabriel, we call him Gabriel. So Gabriel is his name, but Peter is also in uh, quite a common name here in Sweden. You know, both of them, Peter and Gabriel. It just happened happened that uh, it's as you said, it's also to my my. Um, sort of, uh, you know, the big names in music that have inspired me over the years. Uh, as to your question about uh, the connection between classical music and, and, and in, in, in particular progressive rock, I think there are actually um, some kind of connection. Uh, and I remember starting listening to bands like Procol Harum or The Nice. The Nice were even playing some classical music, but in sort of uh, more like in a rock setting um, with Keith Emerson at the keyboard and uh, bands like Procol Harum, they they took stuff. They they were basically, I would I would guess, more like a, a blues blues band, but they took some classical influences and put it into to uh, rock music and and the most. Uh, commonly known example would be uh, a white shade of pale of course but they they i i had a couple of first procol harum albums but I, I really listened a lot to those albums you know uh, and uh this um you know 
traces of classical music, choral music, and um, it was just something about it that that you know struck a chord with me. And and uh, uh, I, th I think you can find it in in yes music. You can find it in in Genesis and King Crimson, and uh, I mean even in Frank Zappa's music. It's lots of of blues and <laughs> and rock, but you can also find traces of of more more than classical music. I'm sure it's more like Stravinsky or, or whatever, you know, in his music. But uh, so uh, I, th I think that there's definitely, and I mean, even bands like Queen, you can find classical influences in, in, in their music too. Yeah, for sure. Um, I want to ask, how did you find yourself in Transatlantic all those years ago? Well, in fact, I think um, uh, the, the first person I met was was Neil Morris, and I met him just briefly when when we played with Flower Kings in Los Angeles in '97. Uh, he played uh, the same show, so he just came and said hi and said he he listened to uh, some Flower Kings music and he started. I think he even started singing a song to me. He said, oh, "I really like this tune." And, and then we kept in contact uh, via email, and I think I helped him with a couple of, of the places to, to play in, in Europe, you know, addresses and stuff, contacts. So we kept contact um, for about two years, and, and then I know I had, we had an, another friend uh, who, uh, who asked me to send a record to Mike Portnoy. So I sent the record, I didn't hear from him until one day he sent me an email and he said he he was planning to put together a band with Neil Morse and I of course knew Neil already and uh, he asked me if I wanted to join the band you know and they were thinking of uh, the bass player from Marillion and it sounded like a really fun project to me so so that's how it all started you know and then we you know we had a couple of months to to you know to gather songs or or uh, write songs for the project and and then we just met you know and so I think the, for the first time we actually met all the, the four of us was uh, in the studio and about an hour later we set up the instruments and started recording so that's kind of a bizarre <laughs> situation I would say <laughs> you say hi and then one and a half hour later you start recording your first album that's yeah. that's weird but. But uh, there was definitely a kind of a, a, a chemistry w within the band, and and that's something that's uh, you know, you never know. You 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 haven't met the people, and and then you get together to record something, and it could can turn out to something fantastic, but could also turn out to something ugly. But but it was a really nice experience. So so we were you know we were lucky, I guess. So you had the first two albums uh, recorded. And then yep. Neil Morse decided to give it away. How did that? How did that leave you? Well, I think I first heard or, or I read something on the internet, or someone sent me an email about Neil Morse leaving Spock's Beard because that that was his main band at the time, you know. And um, so I said, "Wow," <laughs> because they were having, you know, kind of a, you know, success at the time. They were selling more and more albums, and and suddenly he just decided to leave. Spock's beard, and I th thought, wow, that that was weird. But it didn't occur to me that that he was leaving Transatlantic too. Uh, so when I found out, I was wow. Hmm. But I mean, Transatlantic at the time wasn't really a band. I would say my main band was the Flower Kings, Mike, of course, um, Dream Theater, and Pete was, you know, Marillion. So, so it it wasn't that big of a blow to me really but I, I i felt it was hmm too bad you know i, I really could sense we had a, a, a great third album coming you know whenever that was you know you never know but we we um at the time were just about editing the the live live dvd that we did in holland and uh and then these this news came and uh hmm it was kind of, i don't know it, it it kind of felt empty, but but at the same time I was you know occupied with Flower King, so I didn't think much about it, you know. And then people just kept asking year after year, tour after tour, they were coming up to me and say, "Oh, how about next Transatlantic? When is going to happen? Is it going to happen, etc." And I, I said, "I have no idea. You have to ask Neil. You know, <laughs> ask Neil." I, I was actually watching the making of uh, DVD that, come, that came with the limited edition last night. Tell us yeah. about the, the premonition you had regarding the, the reformation of the band. 
Well, the thing is that that, as I said, people has been ask they've been asking me for for years and years and years, uh, and uh, when I played live shows, and they keep sending emails and you know asking all the time, do you think there's going to be another transatlantic? So it almost became like an in-house joke <laughs> with, within the band, you know. Uh, the first question someone walks up to you and they say, "Oh, it's going to be another transatlantic," and I, I, I never have an answer, you know. And and I think for the first couple of years, I thought maybe there's going to be another one. But as time went by, it felt like no, it's not going to happen. And I think that probably around 2006 or 2007, I felt that no, it's not going to happen. Too much time has been passing, and and um, it felt like if if it would happen we should have seen it already you know but it it feels like now neil is happy with his solo career and you know and mike is busy with green theater and it's not going to happen but <clears throat> over the years also um as you may know i i played on on one of neil's albums uh, the the question mark did quite a lot on that one and and um and also he's been asking me couple of times to to join him on stage on different occasions and then in 2008 we were playing the same festival in in the United States and then he asked me to join his band uh, playing uh, a stranger in your soul it's like a big one of the big epics from from uh, a bridge across from uh, bridge across from uh, <laughs> forever album and uh, um and Mike was also, I heard the rumor that Mike was, was joining, you know, so I thought that that was almost like a transatlantic reunion. And and, um, and once we met at the hotel, it felt like, you know, just we'd been away for a couple of weeks, you know, so so the chemistry was was there, you know, obviously. And, um, and it was fun. And I think every, each and every one of us, you know, felt that, yeah, that, that was fun and, and it sounded great. So... Probably, I don't know. I probably Neil could tell you, but uh, to me, it felt like that was the starting point of something, you know. And probably Neil started thinking, huh, hmm, maybe, <laughs> maybe we should get together anyway and, and record another album. Because about uh, probably five or six months later, I got an email and he, he said, I, I've been writing something, and, and to me, it feels like it should be transatlantic music, you know. How do you guys feel about, uh, you know, getting together again and record? And, uh, you know, it was uh, a bit of a surprise, I would say. I would say because I sort of, you know, I, it felt like maybe, it, 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 you know, it was not supposed to happen again. But, but uh, of course, I was happy, you know. And, and uh, after that, it was just a question of finding the time and uh, I think mainly the problem was Mike Portman having uh, you know the busy schedule with Dream Theater but af after you know a couple of weeks we could work out the, the time schedule for for the recording and you know and then we were you know just full speed ahead again and <laughs> record <laughs> now I noticed in the making of DVD that that you seem to be the the quieter member of Transatlantic. You, you don't seem to be quite as uh, opinionated as Mike or Neil um, or even Pete. Uh, is, that a, is that a factor that makes Transatlantic such a well-oiled group? I think the thing is that, that um, I mean, uh, first of all, it, it's a, of course, it depends on, on you know, the, the editing of, of the, the making of uh, whoever edited, you know, what they put in, in, in the film. But I think uh, the way I see it, as far as my involvement and my opinions and all that, I, I, I have very strong opinions. <laughs> Everyone who knows me knows that I, I have strong opinions. But I think um, I'm probably, um, I don't know how to put it in English, but it's, it's um, I'm, I'm probably a guy that think twice, you know, before I say something. And I think uh, both Mike and 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 uh, and Pete and and Neil they are more spontaneous. You know, they are sort of you can see it, you can feel it. You know, there's there's lots of of, of, of excitement. You know, and joy. You know, in 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 the making of this album. And I and I may come across as the silent guy 
who doesn't have an opinion or, or don't think it's funny or, you know, whatever. Um, but uh, for me, it's more like I, I, I take in the music. I, I probably go back to the hotel. I listen to stuff. I, I take out the guitar. I think of things. And then I come back the next morning and, and, and I have lots of opinions and I have lots of ideas, you know. And, and as far as this, this film, you, you can't really see those moments because maybe the, the, the guy who was filming wasn't awake or he wasn't up. Yeah, Yet, you know, most so. of those moments are spontaneous moments in the studio. Um, yeah. it, but actually, in the in the DVD of the of the Whirlwind Live Tour, there's a mm -hmm. booklet in there, and Neil Morse quotes you as saying, "It's all about listening." Uh, yeah, is, is that is that generally the approach you like to take? Well, that that was something we were we were talking about on on the tour, you know. And and I I remember Neil saying by the end of the tour, he said, "Wow." <laughs> Wow, that 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 was a new experience, you know. He said uh, something to the effect of, of all those years I've been just thinking about why what I'm playing, uh, uh, my stuff. I concentrate on my singing, my keyboard stuff. And I, I think um, at at the beginning of the tour, I, I I just said, you know, just before we walk on stage, we talk a little bit, and and I said, and I you know he has a little bit of prayer and and all that stuff, and I, I was trying to say a couple of times that everything's going to be fine we just need to listen you sometimes you just stop listening to what you're playing yourself and you start listening to the drummer you start listening to, to the bass player and once you start listening to the other musicians you hear the music in a different way so i think that was kind of a i mean it may sound silly but it, it was kind of a learn, learning experience for neil you know um, he's been playing music all those years you know and he said by the end of the tour that that wow that that was a new experience for me because suddenly i started listening to the other others and i was starting they're starting to, to to trust you know whatever the drummer and the bass player and that i could suddenly lift my hands from the keyboard and just listen or, or i could sing and just trust that the others would fill in you know instead of playing 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 all the time and and playing uh, you know the same levels you know suddenly you turn on the uh, turn down the the volume and you start hearing the acoustic guitar from Daniel, or you start hearing little percussion things from Mike, and so I think that's probably what he <laughs> he tried to say. But that the listening experience, I think it was something that was that was new, you know. And and um, and I've been I've been playing, you know, uh, not only in Flower Kings but with other musicians also, not on a commercial level. But I've I've been playing a lot and lots of jamming, and and when you're jamming, uh, listening is everything, you know. Because if you don't listen to the other musicians, how how you're supposed to play together? You have to listen. You have to have big ears. And you have to listen to what what chords, what rhythms they're playing, and and um, I, I suppose it's pr probably more. I mean, not really jazz, but it's the more the mind of a jazz musician, you know. Because a jazz musician, he has to listen to to his fellow musicians all the time. You know, it's it's like uh, whatever is on the right cymbal or or the piano chords, your you know, bass player is doing the rhythms, the the, the riffs, everything. So um, so it's um, and I th I think uh, I think for Transatlantic, you can feel it in in the Whirlwind album, and you can feel it probably even more on the live DVD that it's kind of a little bit of a new. Uh, development musical i would say that that's how i felt it and i think that's the way neil felt it too after the whirlwind uh, was released last year in classic rock presents prog magazine you were voted uh, in the readers poll as uh, best guitarist of 2009 how do you feel about yeah. that well it's it's you know it's of course it's um you know it's kind of flattering of course but i i, I can't see music in in terms of, of best best you know of anything you know because how can you possibly and i notice seeing like um uh, the name escapes me now but the guy, the guy in dream theater you know being second or something like that and that's kind of ridiculous because he's i mean technically speaking he's he's you know, just beyond me he's he's miles ahead you know so it's um it's i mean all those readers pulse it's um it's of course it's it's a good thing if people listen to my playing or my music and and they enjoy it and they enjoy my playing and my style but i couldn't 
I couldn't really take it too seriously, you know. You can, I mean, probably you could find someone like Alan Holdsworth on on place twenty four or something like that. And how could that be possible? <laughs> I think you know what I'm saying. You yeah. know what I'm saying. It's like it's kind of ridiculous. You know, it's it's who can someone be best? And I, I'm certainly not the best guitar player, and not even in Prague. So I'm I'm just a guy trying to do his best. You know. Well, you may not technically be the best, but I think possibly what the readers were were saying in that poll was your guitar playing that year, uh, in particularly in the transatlantic, made them feel yeah. better than any other guitar playing. I think that's what yeah, it comes I, down to. I suppose, yeah, I suppose it's more like uh, we're not talk, talking uh, technical, I mean, not shops or, or, or the, the shredding thing. It's we're talking, uh, pro- pro- probably talking, uh, uh, I would say, more like an emotional level, probably, as yeah. you say. Made to make them feel good, and and then it's if it's four notes or three notes or one note, or one beat, it doesn't really matter, you know. It's more like the the, the feel, the tone, the the overall feeling, you know, of, of the music. And I guess so. In that know, respect, yeah, yeah, I could, I could accept that. Yeah. <laughs> if you if you're creating those positive feelings with your guitar playing, your job's done. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, um, tell me a bit about Agents of Mercy. I don't know much about uh, this particular project. I only heard Drama Rama uh, mm-hmm. for the first time yesterday. Um, okay. Can you tell me a bit about? Uh, give me a bit of background. Well, the background is that um, around Christmas time two years ago, I I felt that we should put Flower Kings on ice for some time i can't tell how long but it just felt like we've been doing the tours the, the albums so many years and so it felt like we should take a break you know you know to recharge the batteries and all that um and but i mean uh, being the workaholic that i'm i am you know i i, I can't just sit here doing nothing <laughs> so what i set out to do was i think you know i i had a few acoustic songs that i felt I should probably try to you know write some more and see if I can get together a, more like a scaled down acoustic album so that's what I started to do and and when I was probably halfway through that I felt that uh, there were a couple of, of vocal tracks and I felt that maybe maybe I shouldn't sing because then it's probably too close to Flower Kings and it's going to be a little bit more of the same you know more like a acoustic Flower King thing so I found, um, I heard talk about the guy from a band called Unifon, and um, it, it, he just happened to be living in Sweden, in Stockholm, so it's just about an hour from here, you know. And uh, I really liked his voice, uh, it had uh, the character of some of my, my favorite singers uh, through the years, like Stevie Winwood and Gary Broker and, and Peter Gabriel, and... Uh, um, so I contacted him and, and asked him to sing on a couple of songs and then everything went well and I really liked uh, what he did and he added some, um, you know, uh, extra stuff, you know, that that I hadn't think, uh, been thinking of and um, so, it, I don't know, for some reason it, it we just continued working together and he, he did another song and another song and, and by the end I, I think he sang on eight eight songs on that album and uh, I think I even wrote one or two new songs and they turned out to be maybe less acoustic and more traditional prog rock maybe I got cold feet and I didn't want to <laughs> release a fully acoustic album I don't know anyway so so that was the first uh, Agents of Mercy album The Fading Ghost of Twilight that we released uh, March uh, 2009 and uh, after that, we went out and played some shows together with Car Mechanic, that is Jonas Rangels, the bass player of Flower Kings, his band. Uh, we went on out on a double bill together with them, and, um, you know, we really enjoyed each, each other's company in the band. You know, we had a great keyboard player, Lala Larson, and a new drummer, and... and um, yeah, so it felt like um, it, it wasn't really a one-off project. It, more f- it felt like th- this, this feels like a band. We should probably continue writing and, and make another album. And that uh, resulted in Drama Rama, the new album. 
so, so I think that's the that's the plan to continue and work, and we're already writing for the next album. So, so uh, I mean, if it works, it's it's like that with music. You 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 hook up with musicians. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it works for one album. Sometimes it feels like you know, like transatlantic. We could probably do like like another five albums. I'd be happy with that. You know, and and with Aiden Summers, it's probably the same thing. It's as as long as we can write music and and perform it live, and we can. Um, we can actually uh, enjoy being on the road together and all that. It's it's fine. I think you should just uh, continue doing it. Yeah, I, I love the artwork on Drama Rama, along with the Digi book. But the artwork particularly reminds me of um, oh some Pendragon, Marillion uh, covers uh-huh. that I've seen. Um, how important do you feel packaging is in this day and age, particularly with the download culture that uh, the world is, seems to be in at the moment? Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, for probably for 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 people in my age, I'm I'm over fifty now, and and I grew up with vinyl records and and all that, you know. And in you, you remember the vinyl records, the the Beatles albums, and the Yes Topographic, and all that, you know, the the crazy Elton John albums, you know. It's um, I think I think it's important, absolutely, because guys like me, we want to own the album. It's to me, I. I mean, honestly, I've never downloaded an album. I, I, I guess I could, but I, if if I want an album, I don't go to iTunes and download it. I I go probably to the shop and buy it. And if there's no shop, I probably go to the Amazon and and buy the the physical album. You know. Uh, and I think many people my age and and younger they feel that they want the physical product rather than. Uh, I mean, the other thing is the the, the sound quality. Um, I I I I want to go for as good sound quality as possible, you know. And then I buy the physical album. And um, I think, um, well, I rem- remember the days when you, you 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 bought a new album and then you you put it on on your vinyl player and and you started opening the gatefold and and put out, out all the little extras <laughs> that were in you know reading the stuff reading about the band and reading the lyrics and all that you know looking at the pictures if the, if if it was a live album you were looking at the live pictures you know imagine what it was like being there seeing whatever queen or yes or so I think it's yeah I think it's important you know so we try to spend a little bit on that you know because uh, you know it's it's it uh, it take take away a little bit of the profit but I I rather do that because looking at it just trying to put myself in the position of, of the potential fan, you know. I I would like a nice, uh, like a nice digi pack, and with as many pages as possible, you know. Or looking at the transatlantic packages, you know, it's the luxury uh, big boxes. It's uh, it's fabulous. I think it's it's great, you know. Some people really want to own that, you know, and the vinyls and, and stuff like that. So yeah. So so what's ahead? For you in the next, uh, say, one to two years, you, you said you're already working on a new Agents of Mercy album, uh, but Flower Kings is on hold. Anything else in the works? Um, well, let's put it this way. If Flower Kings is on hold, but I've, I've been starting to, for the first time, thinking about a, a new Flower Kings album. I, I discussed it with Jonas a couple of weeks ago, and, and uh, we're looking at it, but I can't say for sure <laughs> yet. <laughs> I guess we just look at the at the songs, at the material, and see if we, if we think it's... Because if you've been away for a couple of years, then you come back, you need something that's really strong, really striking, you know. And um, But but again, we're looking at it, and as I said, uh, Agents of Mercy, we're working on a new album, uh, planning to go into the studio in April, uh, springtime. And um, transatlantic, I couldn't tell. Uh, when I get the call, I'll be there. You know, it's uh, mostly up to Neil, I think. Again, uh, as you know, Mike is now out of Dream Theater, and I think he he finished uh, his um, his time with Avenged Sevenfold also. Um, so, so when it happens, it happens. You know, it could be uh, could be next year, it could be the year after that. Can't tell. And then um, I have a, a few other projects, and the, the thing I'm actually working on right now is, is more like a, I don't know how to put it, it's more like um, uh, symphonic rock with the, 
emphasis maybe on symphonic because it's like a symphonic piece I've been writing on since 2006 I think and uh, it feels like it's uh, quite I don't know not not the most commercial piece of music <laughs> I've been written if you know what I mean yeah. so it's uh, kind of demanding and and um, but at the same time, I think I can't just uh, hold back because I think it's it won't sell much. You know, it's probably not a big seller. But at the same time, it I think I owe it to the music to at least be available f- for for whoever want to buy it. You know, and and it's uh, I think it's a great piece of music, and it's it shows a little bit more. I would put it probably. Uh, I don't know, somewhere in between uh, classic progressive rock with the emphasis on classic and uh, a little bit of sometimes I can hear hints of, of Miles Davis sketches of Spain and sometimes I can hear hints of of Astor Piazzolla uh, music. Uh, it's kind of dramatic, you know, and, and uh, I'm thinking of having certain sections just uh, like a full orchestra, other pieces more like a rock band with orchestra, other pieces maybe more like uh, shorter pieces with just rock band. So I don't know what, what to compare it to, but um, there were a couple of things done. I think Deep Purple did something in the late 60s with, with an orchestra. I can't remember exactly now because I don't have it, have the, have it on CD. But um, So it's, it's kind of exciting to do, but at the same time I realize it's very... You know, as I said, uncommercial music. So it's not like all the all my progressive rock fans gonna say, "Wow, that's a great album." They're probably gonna say, "Oh, that's boring. That's boring." I like his other music, but that's that's boring. <laughs> that's too much <laughs> pretension. You've, you've, all, you've also got to do what feels good for you too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and I think I can at this time I can afford it because because of the success of Transla- transatlantic and stuff. I can actually. I don't need to go out there and and really hunt for buyers, you know. If you know what I mean, it's like I can actually take maybe a two or three months off and and concentrate on doing this and and doing it as good as I can, just to to you know to produce an album and have it out there and and you know see what happens. And if if not for anything else, for my my own listening pleasures, I would say <laughs> it certainly does sound uh, exciting. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, yeah. Ruina Stolt, thanks very much for talking with me tonight. Yeah, you're welcome. Great talking, and I, I really hope to come to Australia someday. You know, it's been, I think, the only continent except for Africa that we haven't played yet. So, yeah, I'm hoping, keeping fingers crossed. <laughs>